So, a few years ago, I remember picking up the Evening Standard and seeing a, seeing a headline. And the headline was about this Muslim cab driver who had refused a guide dog from coming into his cab. And it was a particularly special week that week because I clocked that the Evening Standard had a headline about Muslims for five days running. Must be a record of any local or international newspaper. But this one really caught my eye. That here was a poor fella with his CNI dog, his guide dog, and he'd been refused entry into a cab by a Muslim. And so I started digging around, and over the years I've dug around. And one only needs to do a few cursory Google searches, but to find an entire internet community of folks who uh, have dedicated their lives to convincing us, all of us, that Muslims, nay, Allah himself, hates dogs. <laughs> and it is not unusual that I meet dog owners who, upon seeing my son's great delight at their dog, are slightly confused because they'll say to me quietly, but I thought Muslims don't like dogs. I heard you were afraid of dogs. Are you allowed to pet a dog? <laughs> and this got me thinking about my own life and my own experiences with dogs. And I have to say that there is a kernel of truth, not to the hatred, but certainly to a very tortured relationships, relationship that some Muslims have with our canine friends. Let me explain. I grew, up, I grew up in a house where we didn't do dogs. We didn't even do cats, frankly, and all the goldfish died. <laughs> but we definitely didn't do dogs, and there was always a sense when I grew up that, that, you know, dogs were something to be a little bit feared. I was always fearful of them. I always felt like I had to stay away from dogs. Part of that was around issues of cleanliness and purity, but as a child, I never really understood that. All I understood was I had to kind of stay away a little bit. And I have to say, I didn't really question until much later in life that where does this kind of hang-up come from? Especially since when I would go back to Pakistan and I'd go to my grandfather and grandmother's house, there was a lovely little pooch who used to live in the backyard. We used to call her the Pearl, Mochi. Um, allegedly, Mochi was a guard dog. I don't think she could have guarded against anything. <laughs> but she was there and she was well loved by the family. So I've, I started digging a little bit and started looking at this issue of dogs. Because there's no doubt about it, there is this sense out there, and our friends in the right wing gutter press love it. They like to think that somehow, because of Muslim ambivalence, at the very least, to dogs. This is proof. I've read in right-wing American blogs that the barbarity and the cruelty that Muslims show to other human beings is fully compatible with their hatred for dogs. <laughs> that anyone who co doesn't love dogs must necessarily be a bad person. And, you know, it disturbs me that stuff like this gets... Um, airplay, that stuff like this gets headlined, but at some level, I want to understand as a Muslim what my faith says about dogs. So, it's best to dive into the source texts, the Quran. What does the holy book have to say about dogs? I can here say with great certainty, not being a scholar of Arabic or of the Quran per se, that the Quran says very little about dogs. But there is a very important dog in the Quran. A dog who's, who plays a very important role in a story. There's a, there's, a, there's a story in the Quran that is told about a group of young men who, surrounded by iniquity and vice in their societies, by violence and by unjust rulers, retreat to a cave. And they go into the cave and this, this story is told in many ways, but they go into the cave and God grants them sleep. 
they become the sleepers of the cave and they they exist there for a long long time and God keeps them safe from the world that has gone crazy around them and the Quran mentions to us indeed that there is with them their dog and this dog is so loyal that the that this dog basically stretches himself across the entrance of the cave and waits for um, waits for his masters to come awake and it's interesting to me that when these men awake hundreds of years later the Quran speaks about their company as being blessed and then the Quran gets into a very interesting interesting debate because in pre-Islamic times the story was often told and some people would say there was a certain number of of sleepers in the cave and their dog but was their dog included as one of their number or was not included as one of their number were there more of them or were there less of them these kinds of arguments happen in religious texts but what the Quran affirms is that the dog was part of their blessed company that the dog was considered one of these blessed people who was put to sleep in the cave. So it seems to me that the Quran itself seems to acknowledge this dog as a creature that has not only blessed company, but performed an incredibly blessed act. The Quran also tells us about the animal world, the natural world. And we are told that the natural world exists in communities like our own, that the natural world is ordered and that amongst uh, and in the natural world, communities of animals are also ordered. So there's a certainly this acknowledgement that animals themselves have communities and have complexity, things that we now already know. So where does this ambivalence come from? To understand this ambivalence, I think we have to go back into religious law. Sorry for the digression. But work with me here. So, any source, any sacred law, any law in general, sacred or secular, has sources, has places from which that law is derived. In rabbinic law, for instance, the rabbis go back to the Torah. And if they don't find things in the Torah, they, they go to the Talmud. If they don't find things in the Talmud, they go to the Midrash. They go to the rulings and the analysis and the reflections of the great rabbis who went before. In the same way, Islamic law or Islamic religious law is derived from the sources of the Quran and the sayings and the example of the Prophet Muhammad. But then the law itself is also based on precedents that over time there are certain rulings. Those rulings are debated, argued, reflected upon accepted, rejected. There's a process, and that open, happens over hundreds, even thousands of years. And so in the source texts, while the Quran might not say a lot about dogs, we know that the sayings and the actions of the Prophet have certain things to say about dogs. And of course, the evidence that comes from the Prophet himself is contradictory. There are some narrations of the Prophet that praise dogs, and in fact, kindness to animals is considered one of the hallmarks of the way of the Prophet Muhammad and something that Muslims from a very young age learn, that kindness to animals in the natural world was one of the great gifts that the Prophet gave us. And his example is an example of one who should have stewardship and care over the natural world. But there are other statements of the, uh, of, of the Prophet where it says that one should not have a dog in the house, for instance. Or there was a time when the prophet was going to receive revelation, but the angel did not enter the home because there was a, there was a dog present. So the, so the evidence that comes to us is a little bit contradictory, perhaps, on the surface level, and a little bit ambivalent. What is, the, what is one of the key factors in any religious practice? Well, certainly for Muslims, one of the key factors in religious practice and religious devotion itself is purity in advance of prayer. As many of us know, I hope all of us know, is that Muslims pray five times a day. 
We pray in the morning, before the sun rises, in the afternoon, the late afternoon, early evening, and in the evening. These are formalized prayers with very specific rituals that go along with them. Before we perform these prayers, we have to have a state of ritual purity. And I think this is where, for me, the crux of the matter came. It was to understand that this idea of a dog being clean or unclean was really in reference to something that we would term as ritual purity. That these are certain rituals that one has to go through, divest oneself of certain dirtiness, certain things, and then come to the prayer ready for the prayer. Many faith traditions have this. Sometimes it's ablution. Sometimes it's certain washing that one does. Sometimes it's certain prayers one invokes. And so it became clear to me as I went into the interpretations of Islamic law from the various schools of legal thought and formulation that a lot of this concern about dogs was around whether dogs are, affect one's ritual purity or not. And even in this case, there's some difference about this. In three of the dominant schools of Sunni Islam, the dog's saliva, for instance, is considered uh, a, an impurity in terms of ritual impurity. If the dog licked me across the face, I'd have to go wash my face because I wouldn't be ritually pure. However, one of the great schools of Islamic law, the school that, is lar that, school that influences the practice of Muslims in places like Morocco, in West Africa, as Abdul Hamid was saying, uh, earlier, they follow the school of a great scholar of the city of Medina, the city to which the Prophet migrated from Mecca, Imam Malik. And in his school of Islamic law that he founded, dogs are not unclean at all. In fact, the saliva of the dog, the hair of the dog, the body of the dog, any of that is not unclean for the sake of ritual purity. Which means to me that there is more to this story than meets the eye. So I decided, let's go a little bit deeper. I want to share with you a very, a, a, a really interesting statement of one of the great companions of the Prophet, Imam Ali, the uh, son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad and the fourth caliph, the fourth leader of the Muslim community according to the Sunni tradition after the Prophet passed away. Imam Ali said, happy is the one who leads the life of a dog. For the dog has ten characteristics which everyone should possess. First, the dog has no status among creatures. Second, the dog is a pauper, having no worldly goods. Third, the entire earth is his resting place. Fourth, the dog goes hungry most of the time. Fifth, the dog will not leave his master's door even after receiving a hundred lashes. Sixth, he protects his master and his friend. And when someone approaches, he will attack the foe and let the friend pass. Seventh, he guards his master by night, never sleeping. Eighth, he performs most of his duties silently. Ninth, he is content with whatever his master gives him. And tenth, when he dies, he leaves no inheritance. <laughs> so the idea that the dog is actually considered almost like a spiritual master in its own right, that by living with such simplicity, in its life, a dog reflects certain characteristics to which all human beings should uh, aspire to, especially of having nothing in the world and of being service to other people, seems to be a pretty compelling argument for recovering the dog within the Islamic tradition. But then I found something else, which was most interesting, and I hope you will enjoy. I found the work of a ninth century legal scholar of Baghdad whose name was Ibn al-Marzuban. And Ibn al-Marzuban wrote an incredibly interesting book titled, ready for this, The Superiority of Dogs Over Many of Those Who Wear Clothes. <laughs> That's the actual name of the book. The superiority of dogs over many of those who wear clothes seemed like it was a, a defense, not only of the domestication of dogs, but the spiritual value of the dog. That the dog itself became a symbol of nobility and spirituality. And Ibn Marzuban brought forward evidence from the time of the Prophet to show that dogs not only guarded and were used in hunting as hounds, but were these noble creatures. 
And we are told in Marzuban's book and other books that in fact serving dogs as one person did on a hot day, we are told the story, some would say a fable, but we're told the story uh, b uh, by the prophet of a dog that was dying in the heat and someone gave that dog uh, water from their own water and found that at the end of that giving of water, that paradise was the gift that that person received for the kindness that they showed to this, to this incredible animal. And Ibn Marzuban particularly goes through this idea of being, and in fact uses the terminology, interestingly enough, of the dog being man's best friend. And this is found in the ninth century of the Islamic, of the Islamic tradition. And so, what it revealed to me was something that was akin to the mix of legal, cultural, and civilizational. I think for some of us who come from more conservative legal traditions, where in fact the, the fact that the saliva of a dog, which is true in certain legal traditions, or the hair of the dog, is considered, uh, makes us ritually impure for prayer, has kind of become extended into a general fear of, please dog, don't touch me which is pretty much the way I grew up. It's like, dog, dog, stay. But the truth is that if the dog was to have licked me or was to have touched me, I simply needed to wash my clothes or change my clothes, and I could have said my prayers and done my ablutions. It wasn't anything I should have been fearful of, and it wasn't anything I should have been too excited about. But as with all things like this, we often have cultural amplifications of our like or dislike of certain animals, of certain foods, of certain customs and certain rituals. And I think that maybe accounts for the diversity of opinion within the Islamic tradition when it comes to dogs, but also, also speaks to some of the hysteria that others have created about dogs. Now that having been said, in any religious tradition, you find a range of interpretations, and not only a range of interpretations, a range of ways to deal with those interpretations. Recently in Malaysia, there was a please come and pet a dog event, organized by a man who had seen that in fact his co-religionists had such a negative relationship with dogs, he wanted to introduce dog owners to other Muslims, and he invited people into a park and said, dog owners, bring your dogs. People who don't have dogs and maybe fearful of them come, let's pet dogs, let's normalize dogs. The poor man was sent horrible messages from very conservative, um, some, for some, some conservative Muslims, and unfortunately some conservative Muslim scholars who condemned him for, for doing this and said he was mocking the faith. A sad state of affairs. I wish they'd read the fatwa of the former Grand Mufti of Egypt, who, who although he doesn't belong to the Maliki tradition, Mufti Ali Guma declared that dogs were not impure at all. So maybe there is a change going on in the Muslim world that Muslims are becoming more comfortable with dogs. But that leads us back to the question that I began with. Does Allah hate dogs? Well, I don't think Allah hates dogs. Allah created dogs. Um, does Islam hate dogs? Certainly not. Do Muslims hate dogs? I would say most do not. There might be some who do. But I know other people who hate dogs too. So I think the next time we see headlines like, like, you know, Cabby refuses dogs, if he in fact did that, bad on the Cabby. But I think when we see headlines like that, I think all of us owe it to ourselves to know that sometimes these headlines certainly don't tell the truth, but actually obscure a much more richer, vibrant, interesting, and frankly compelling history. For all that, for all that having been said, um, I sometimes do wonder if we'll ever have a dog in our house. Maybe our demand for ritual purity is so high. We haven't gotten, we haven't passed that road yet. But if I was to give the decision to my son, boy, we'd have a puppy, we'd have a puppy tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>